So I'm excited to share with you today uh, the work that we are doing in my laboratory um, to enhance regeneration and to fight cancer. Um, and so in my laboratory, we study how stem cells communicate with their environment. And by doing that, I want to focus today on how stem cells can reconstruct their lymphatic niche um, uh, during regeneration and what happened in cancer and aging. So let me start by telling you that our body has a remarkable regenerative capacity and in a single day we lose and replace billions of cells and that's completely normal. Um, the way that I like to think about it is that we all know how we woke up this morning but we must have changed several times since then and this is not just a fantasy story out of Alice in Wonderland. And there is also a paradox in that because we know that the key players in this regenerative process are the stem cells and they have a balanced selfie decision. They know when and where to create a tissue. But stem cells can also age. And so if they are creating less tissue, we're aging. But if they do too much of what they need to do, um, we can develop diseases such as cancer. Essentially, we are missing a fundamental understanding of what dictates stem cell fate decision and how this is balanced throughout regeneration. And the skin is really an excellent and exciting model to ask these type of questions because the skin is a house for multiple types of stem cells, including those that create the skin on your body, the, the barrier from the external environment, and the hair follicles that grow. And this is the beautiful picture that you see in the screen. Um, and so essentially what we wanted to understand is how the stem cells that exist in the skin can integrate systemic changes across them to uh, balance their fate cell decisions. And one system that potentiates to uh, regulate that process is the vascular system that create a network in our body that can really synchronize those um, uh, uh, signals that pass through our body to the stem cells. And normally when I talk about the vascular system, most of you probably think about the blood vessels that um, carry cells and nutrients into our tissues. But we also have one more system, and this is the lymphatic vascular system. This system will drain excess fluids and macromolecules from the tissue back into the circulatory system. And so now I can really focus and ask how the vascular system coordinate the regenerative process in the skin. Um, to do that, we use three-dimensional imaging and tissue clearing. And what you can see here in red are the lymphatic capillaries in the skin. And we were pretty much amazed to see how the lymphatic capillaries forming a niche for the stem cells in the hair follicle stem cells. We could also model that type of interaction and to visualize how the stem cells are nesting on top of the lymphatic capillaries when they are at the resting phase. So this is when the stem cells are basically not doing anything. There are existing in the skin and they are not growing hair at that point. So now we're going to take a virtual tour into our skin to better understand the nature of those interactions. Um, what we noticed is that the lymphatic capillaries here in white are creating protrusions that emerge towards the stem cells and holding them together, um, kind of protecting them, doing something to them to make them uh, um, quiescent or basically in the resting phase. So we wanted to understand why is that happening and why is that important. We started by profiling the stem cells themselves. So when we profiled them using either bulk RNA sequencing or single cell RNA sequencing, we found something very remarkable. We found that the stem cells themselves highly express a protein called angiopoietin-like 7 that is known to regulate vascular biology um, and, and lymphatic biology. But it was only in the stem cells and not in any other cell type in the skin. And you can also see it very clearly in the single cell RNA sequencing. And so the stem cells themselves secrete lymphoangiogenic factor. And essentially what we found is that the stem cells themselves in the hair follicle secrete angiopoietin like 7 to control lymphatic behavior, to control how lymphatic will drain fluids and macromolecules. On the other hand, when the stem cells turn into their regenerative state, then they secrete other factor. They are switching their secretome to secrete angiopoietin like 4, and that um, um, control reduced lymphatic drainage and an ability to control how stem cell fate decision will look like, whether will, they will regenerate a tissue or will not regenerate a tissue. And so essentially what we found is that we have a new niche cell component right now in hand that nobody have heard before. 
this is the lymphatic vessels, and that the stem cells themselves can shape their lymphatic microenvironment. But is it true to all of our, our tissues? Because what I showed you so far is that this is true for the hair follicle stem cells, but these stem cells act in cycles. They will either grow or don't grow hair, and this is why we see cycles of hair growth on our body. But some other organ, such as the intestine, is constantly regenerating all the time. Those stem cells in the intestine are constantly activated. So can it be that one niche, like the lymphatic microenvironment, rule or decay? dictate self-aid decisions in the intestine, in the skin, in a very similar way, even though their regenerative demand is so different. And so this is actually stemming from a very um, fun and important collaboration between gastroenterologist in Whale Cornell um, and computational genius um, in the lab of Dana Payer, where we were trying to understand how lymphatics in the intestine is working and in informing a niche for the um, um, intestinal stem cells. So we first started to um, profile the vascular system in the intestine. And in red, you can see the blood vessels, and as expected, the intestine is highly vascularized, but we could also see that there is a very rich vascular network of lymphatic capillaries that reside just beneath the crypt where the stem cell resided. And so using, again, three-dimensional imaging, we could visualize and see how the LGR5 positive stem cells in the intestine here in green are nesting on top of the lymphatic capillaries also in the in the um, in the intestine and that is happening across the intestine no matter if it was the colon or the small intestine that type of interaction was consistent all along so why is that important here? Why do stem cells here need the, the, the lymphatics? So to understand that, we established a co-culture system where we can take the organoids that are forming in the um, in intestine in, in vitro and to grow them on top of lymphatic capillaries. And the beauty is that in culture, those um, intestinal stem cells can form the crypt-like base and to differentiate. So we can measure or trace how their balanced selfie decisions are happening. Um, and so what we saw is that when the stem cells are being cultured on top of lymphatic capillaries, the stem cells are maintaining their identity, but they're not doing much. They cannot really regenerate. They cannot rege produce the differentiated progeny. So how is that happening? Why is that happening? To do that, we turn into tr spatial transcriptomics um, to understand how the lymphatics at the base of the crypt can produce factors or do something that is very different from lymphatics that are not nesting the stem cells, like those in the villi. Um, and so we performed spatial transcriptomics and we um, uh, projected the data on the crypt villi axis. And so this is the data that you can see here and we could beautifully see lymphatics. This is the purple line over here. The lymphatics that are nesting at the base versus lymphatic that are at the uh, villus. And so now we can ask what is the difference between lymphatics at the base versus those that are at the villus and are not touching stem cells. And what we found is that the lymphatic at the base are actually secreting factors that are considered to be stem cell factor, known stem cell factor, like r bonding 3. But we also found a novel factor called railing. And railing was specifically expressed at the crypt base, but not in the villi. And we found by functional data that this railing can dictate how selfie decisions are happening, what basically cause the stem cells to either produce differentiated cells or not produce differentiated cells. And so what I showed you right now is that we have the lymphatic niche that again, this is completely new to our knowledge, but it will form a niche to different tissues with completely distinct uh, regenerative demands. Um, but we also all know that we find a niche that is important for regeneration, but we all know that regeneration is an arrow with a one negative direction, and aging will affect or affecting all of us. So we're spending a lot of time in the lab thinking how we can treat the stem cells, how we can manipulate the stem cells or target the lymphatic stem cell interaction so we can maintain this regenerative capacity. 
Um, or more importantly, we can also think about how we can reverse aging, how we can take those stem cells that are considered to be age or the environment that is considered to be age and, and to engineer the system differently. And so, as I said, we're all going to experience aging. It's not something that is completely far away from us. So how do you know that you age? Um, the skin is usually the first mark of us being aging, uh, during aging. Um, our, the skin texture is different. We, we see more wrinkles. The wounds on our skin take so much more time to heal than we were um, young. And so how is the microenvironment or the lymphatic microenvironment look like in the age um, skin? So that's a question that we were interested in. And what we found is that when we age, lymphatics are no longer maintain their structure. They are become dilated, they're dysfunctional, and they're no longer, you can clearly see that their structure is completely different. Um, but what is about, what happening to the association of stem cells with lymphatics? So we know that the structure is different, but are they still associated with lymphatics? So this is exactly what we did. And again, using three-dimensional imaging, you can see here the stem cells in yellow. Well, we were amazed to see that the blood vessels that, are that were considered to be the factor of aging are still highly associated with the stem cells, but lymphatics are no longer during aging. Um, and so that was uh, very surprising to us. And when we looked at mice that we engineered to have a dysfunctional lymphatics, they presented a phenotype of premature hair loss. And so if you don't have functional lymphatics, those hair follicle stem cells will lo no longer regenerate the tissue as much as they need to regenerate. And so thinking forward, we know association right now. We know that excessive or insufficient lymphatic function can give rise to a variety of pathologies or regenerative pathologies, including um, delayed wound repair. I showed you that it's also associated with aging. And later on the, the road, we know that cancer cells are using lymphatics as one of the major exit routes from the primary tumor to seed metastatic diseases in um, uh, distant organs. So what we really want to understand is how lymphatic, or what we want to, to do is to target the lymphatic stem cell interaction so we can enhance regeneration, but at the same time, we want to fight cancer and we want to fight um, uh, the ability of those cancer stem cells to disseminate through lymphatics. So how do we do it? How do we start to, to target that system? So we engineered mice that will have disrupted angiopoietin like seven expression, this factor that is expressed by the stem cells. And what we found is that, again, when we are not having this lymphoangiogenic factors that is secreted by the stem cells, lymphatics are no longer intact and they're massively dilated. So how the stem cell look like? What we found is that in these mice that have dysfunctional angiopoietin like seven secretion specifically by the stem cells, the hair follicle stem cells started to develop hyperplegia. They became big. Their balanced self aid decisions that we started to talk about were no longer there. You can see those big follicles. But these big follicles that you can see here are also highly, or we wanted to understand their association with lymphatics. What we found is that they were highly associated with the lymphatic capillaries. And those capillaries that you see here are humongous. They are big, very, very big lymphatics that are surrounding the hyperplastic um, hair follicle stem cells. When we looked closer in completely different mouse models that have dif dysfunctional lymphatics, we found similar things that happening within the stem cells. We saw that they're starting to accumulate lots of DNA damage in the form of gamma H2AX, which you can see here in magenta. And it didn't matter if it was um, acute lymphatic disruption or if it was uh, chronic lymphatic uh, disruption. Both models show that stem cells starts to accumulate lots of DNA damage. And why is that important? Because with time, especially in our skin, if we accumulate lots of DNA damage, we can develop cancer. And this is one of the forms that cancer can be developed and is squamous cell carcinoma of the skin. And this is one of the most common form of skin cancer. And it accounts for about 1.8 million patients a year in the United States only. It's a lot of patients. Um, Although it rarely metastasizes, uh, when it does, it presents a very, very poor prognosis with a very low uh, survival rate over 10 years. So we need a better solution to fight cancer. And 
in skin cancer, at least at the heart of those uh, tumors that are starting to develop, we have stem cells that will fuel the growth of the tumor, but those stem cells are not working in a void. Um, they have environment that will support them. And if we, again, want to fight cancer, we want to understand how the cancer stem cells are making their environment to work for them or the healthy environment to work for them so they can thrive and metastasize at the end. And so thinking forward, we wanted to understand how those tumor stem cells can interact with their lymphatic microenvironment. And so we looked at the mouse model that has squamous cell carcinoma, and though this mouse model had um, um, cells or the stem cells were marked with a, a reporter, and this is what you can see here, those are red cells. Those are the stem cells within the squamous cell carcinoma of the skin. What we found is when the tumor develops, it starts to um, be highly associated also with lymphatic capillaries. And right now we have um, um, a project that is running in the lab to understand how the tumor cell of origin and how the stem cells that create this tumor form and fuel the growth of the tumor interacting with lymphatics and whether we can target that interaction so we can um, prevent tumors to use lymphatics as the exit route and seed meta metastasis. Uh, so just to wrap up, uh, my laboratory really study how epithelial stem cells communicate with their microenvironment um, with the idea that we want to advance tissue regeneration, we want to, to change the way that we age, we want to change the way that we he that heal wounds, and eventually we want to combat also metast metastatic diseases. And so um, with that, um, we also have um, positions. We have a um, really vibrant group that is already uh, started to emerge. Uh, we have exciting projects. So if you know anyone that is um, interested, please spread the word. Um, and with that, I want to thank my um, amazing lab members already. They're helping me so much to establish a lab, which is it's a hard work and they're doing it together with me and it's really, really fun. Um, my collaborators um, across the world, uh, my funding resources that help to support the work that I've showed you today. And thank you so much for your attention. Um, I think we do have um, a time for a few questions. I'm opening up the questions to you. If anyone have questions. Yes, Kat. had brought up these angiopoietins are actually unusual in their structure and maybe difficult to target are you know how are you thinking about angiopoietin like seven and four in terms of restoring the balance yeah so it's a good question i i, I think in general this is a an the angiopoietin like family if we think about it them they're new to science we don't know much about their structure we don't know almost anything about their receptors so Scientifically, I think it's really hard for us to try to target it, but we are developing new tools and technologies that enables us now to CRISPR out or knock in um, um, those factors so we can manipulate their secretion. What we basically do, we are going to um, uh, change or, or target the stem cell secretome, um, how the stem cells are taking advantage of their environment to, to make regeneration, so we can do it ourselves. So we're developing those tools, we're developing those technologies, but I think for your question also, we want to understand the mechanism. And this is very important for us to, to understand the mechanism because the andropoietin like seven and four may be right in the skin, but not in other organs, for example. But if we understand the mechanism of how we manipulate lymphatic, what lymphatics needs to, to, to control stem cell behavior, then we can kind of bypass this product and, and do it. And these are things that we're constantly um, thinking of um, doing in the lab. Now you question, were people studying um, intralymphatic delivery of anti-cancer drugs for skin cancer? Is that something that people are looking at? Intralymphatic, can you please repeat again? Uh, Intralymphatic delivery. Intralymphatic delivery. Anti cancer okay. drugs. So, great question. I think, uh, in general, what exists in the lymphatics, right? Well, what's inside of that? If you just look at what ex exists inside so we can target it or inject something into it, um, the traditional view is that what 
exist inside lymphatics is a trash. The lymphatic is kind of like the garbage crash, uh, trash, trash of the body, it absorb all the fluids, macromolecules that we don't need, and it's important for immunosurveillance. So all the immune cells that are um, eating all of those antigens will go through lymphatics and, and educate themselves in the lymph node. Um, and so thinking about it, what exists there? Um, is there at all a differential or distinct kind of drainage ability so we can tr control what's going in uh, into lymphatic? Maybe we can target, for example, uh, fat. We know that in the, the, in the intestine, um, lymphatics are important, at least the villi, to absorb fat. And there have been reports that it's important to um, inhibit obesity. Um, and so I think if we would understand better how um, distinct kind of regulation of drainage is happening, maybe we can target drainage and maybe we can inject specific kind of molecules into the lymphatics um, that can kind of travel through uh, the body. Because one of the things that I haven't shown in this work is that when we manipulate the lymphatics to become dysfunctional, no, uh, the stem cells will no longer be balanced, but also synchronized regeneration will not happen. So one stem cells will not no longer know about the other stem cells if it needs to regenerate a tissue or not. So synchronized regeneration is an important thing. And for your question, can we actually inject something into the lymphatic to synchronize tissue regeneration, not only in the skin, but maybe in the intestine, in the lung? So to synchronize this regenerative process is something that um, um, hasn't been worked out at all. Yes. Hi, great talk. Um, Thank you. I actually want to expand on something you said for synchronized regeneration. Yes. So have you ever looked into cellular senescence with regards to all of this? Because there's been mounting evidence, like in the Campisi lab and the Buck Institute, that the influx of cellular senescence is actually needed for synchronized regeneration of skin tissue. And there's also been a study in skeletal muscle where they did a uh, single cell RNA-seq. And most senescent cells are actually um, foreign immune cells infiltrating into the tissue to help repair it. So I'm wondering if you ever looked into that to see the underlying mechanism, if there's any interaction with these immune cells that are expressing senescent markers and in the lymphatic vessels. I love this question because um, I think in, in general, we were talking about mechanism and how is that happening. Senescence may be one of the part of what exactly lymphatic is doing there to the stem cells. And one of the things that I find really fascinating is that it's a network, right? It's not only a mesenchymal cells that will nest the stem cells, it's a network that will exist across the tissue. If you think about the intestine, the lungs, or the skin, we have this as a, as a system, as a network that can sample things and can deliver information from one side to another. Um, and you're talking about senescence, so in the skin, um, that hasn't been worked out at all, but at least in the intestine, there's something very interesting. Because if you induce senescence in one spot, the other distant spot will sense it and, and become senescence as well, and nobody knows why. And I think it's really interesting way to think about, in general, synchronized regeneration, synchronized aging, and if we can target it to, to synchronized regeneration across the tissue. So I haven't, uh, to your question, I haven't looked at senescence, but I love this question, so. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>